mountain views, cascading waterfalls. Have you ever found yourself wide awake, unable to sleep, scrolling through deep internet rabbit holes on Wikipedia? Especially on creepy Wikipedia pages, it feels like a never-ending string. No matter how much you pull at the loose ends, it always ends on an eerie note. I absolve you from your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The only thing scarier on the internet might be the deep or dark web, but these Wikipedia pages are some of the most mysterious things you'll find online. Here are some pages that are so creepy you might need to prove you're an adult to visit them. The Lead Crime Hypothesis For decades, the rise and fall of crime rates puzzled sociologists and policymakers alike. Then, in the 1990s, something strange happened. Crime rates began to plummet across the United States, a trend that continued into the new millennium. Theories about the reasons behind this dramatic decline are abundant. Tougher policing, shifting drug markets, or even legalized abortion. Yet, lurking beneath these explanations lies a more unsettling possibility. The lead crime hypothesis. Lead, a toxic metal, was once ubiquitous in everyday life, particularly in gasoline. For years, vehicles belched out clouds of lead-laden exhaust, saturating cities and neighborhoods, especially those already disadvantaged by poverty. Scientists now know that no amount of lead exposure is safe, particularly for developing brains. The damage, while invisible, is lasting. Lead interferes with cognitive development, lowers IQ, and perhaps most chillingly, fosters impulsivity and aggression. These traits, studies suggest, may set the stage for criminal behavior later in life. The lead crime hypothesis gained traction in the early 2000s. Advocates argue that the sharp reduction in crime during the 1990s mirrors the phase-out of leaded gasoline, which began in the 1970s. The logic is chillingly simple. Children born during the era of high lead exposure would come of age in the crime-ridden decades of the 70s and 80s, their cognitive and behavioral development forever warped by the toxins they unknowingly inhaled. As lead exposure declined, so too did crime rates. Could something as mundane as leaded gasoline explain a generation's descent into violence? If the lead crime hypothesis holds true, it's a reminder that some of the greatest dangers to society come not from visible threats, but from the slow, silent poisons lurking in the air. Before moving on, time for something morbid. Recently, a dark web user stumbled onto what appeared to be a hidden Wikipedia page. Apparently, the page is haunted, as the creator of it took his life shortly after creating it. But what do think? A creepypasta or something truly otherworldly? Sogen Kato In the summer of 2010, Japan was poised to celebrate one of its oldest residents, Sogen Kato who had reportedly reached the age of 111. Ward officials from Adachi, Tokyo, eager to honor Kato on respect for the aged day, made several attempts to meet him. Each visit was met with strange and evasive excuses from his family, claims that Kato was a human vegetable, or even more bizarrely, that he had become a Sokushinbutsu, a self-mummified Buddhist monk. When the authorities finally forced their way into the Kato family home, what they found was nothing short of horrifying. Lying in a bed wrapped in blankets and still dressed in pajamas were the mummified remains of Sogen Kato. Newspapers in the room dated back to 1978, suggesting that the elderly man had been dead for over 30 years. The family had concealed his death, leading officials to believe he was still alive all those years, quietly cashing in on his pension. The revelation sent shockwaves across Japan. Kato, once thought to be a symbol of longevity, had instead become a symbol of neglect and greed. His family had collected millions of yen in pension payments, all while hiding his decaying corpse in their home. His daughter even admitted they had left him untouched since his death, his body becoming a silent occupant of their home, out of sight but never truly gone. Eben Byers In the early 20th century, Eben Byers was a man of prominence, a wealthy American socialite, sportsman, and industrialist. He won the 1906 U.S. Amateur Golf Championship and led a life of privilege. But his tragic end would be a cautionary tale about the dangers of unregulated medicine and the deadly allure of radium. Byers' downfall began in 1927, 
following a minor injury he sustained after falling from a railway sleeping berth. Seeking relief from persistent pain, his doctor recommended Redithor, a patent medicine that was nothing more than radium salts dissolved in water. Marketed by William J. A. Bailey, a fraudulent doctor, Redithor was one of many so-called miracle cures of the time, believed to revitalize and invigorate the body. Bailey made a fortune selling Redithor, promising its users a boost in health while giving physicians a kickback for each prescription. Convinced of its benefits, buyers began consuming three bottles of Radithor daily, believing it improved his vitality. Over the course of several years, he consumed an astonishing 1,400 doses. But by 1930, the once healthy sportsman began to deteriorate. The toned-up feeling had disappeared and what followed was far more sinister. Byers' teeth began to fall out and his bones weakened. By 1931, his condition had worsened dramatically. Most of his jawbone had disintegrated and holes had formed in his skull. When Byers was too ill to travel, the Federal Trade Commission sent a lawyer to take his statement at his home. The lawyer described a horrifying scene, with Byers' jawbone mostly gone and his body slowly wasting away. Byers' death on March 31, 1932, was attributed to the devastating effects of radiation poisoning, caused by the radium that had accumulated in his bones. Byers' death sent shockwaves through the public, exposing the dangers of radioactive cures. The incident led to a heightened awareness of the risks posed by such unregulated products. Radithor was pulled from the market and its manufacturer, Bailey, was ordered by the Federal Trade Commission to cease promoting the product's supposed benefits. The tragedy of Eben Byers stands as a chilling reminder of how ignorance and the pursuit of health can sometimes lead to disastrous consequences, and his story played a significant role in curbing the dangerous era of radium-based quack medicine. Balloon Fest 86 what began as a whimsical fundraising stunt for the United Way in Cleveland, Ohio, quickly spiraled into an unforgettable catastrophe. Balloon Fest 86, held on September 27, 1986, was intended to set a world record by releasing 1.5 million helium balloons into the sky, a vision meant to dazzle onlookers and bring lighthearted joy to the city. However, what followed was anything but lighthearted. The preparation was as grand as the concept itself. A massive rectangular structure the size of a city block was built to contain the inflating balloons. Inside, 2,500 volunteers worked tirelessly, filling the skybound orbs, their enthusiasm matching the scale of the event. When the moment finally came, the balloons soared into the sky, creating a multicolored spectacle that mesmerized the crowd. Yet, beneath this fleeting beauty, disaster loomed. A cold front descended on Cleveland that day, and what should have been a harmless release of balloons into the stratosphere became a floating obstacle course of havoc. The balloons, instead of rising gracefully and disappearing, were forced back to Earth, littering the streets, Lake Erie, and even Burke Lakefront Airport, causing a runway shutdown. The festive mood quickly turned somber as the city began to realize the unintended consequences of this colorful chaos. Far more tragic was how the balloons interfered with a Coast Guard search for two missing fishermen. As the rescuers desperately combed the waters of Lake Erie, the balloon-filled horizon made it impossible to spot the stranded boaters. Both men were later found drowned, their bodies washing ashore in the days following the event. In the aftermath, Balloon Fest 86 remains an eerie, cautionary tale of spectacle gone awry, both mesmerizing and nightmarish in its failure. Matahari The name Matahari conjures images of an exotic dancer, draped in mystery and scandal, her life entangled in espionage and seduction. Born Margarita Gertruida Zelle, in 1876, she would rise to fame as a performer, captivating audiences across Europe with her sultry performances that blended elements of East Asian dance. But behind the allure and veils, Matahari was living a dangerous double life, one that would ultimately lead to her demise. At the height of World War I, Europe was a hotbed of paranoia and intrigue. As borders shifted and alliances crumbled, governments became desperate for intelligence. It was in this volatile environment that Matahari was accused of being a spy not just for one side but for both the French and the Germans. Her travels across countries, frequent interactions with high-ranking officials, and mysterious connections made her a prime suspect 
in the shadowy world of espionage. On the morning of October 15, 1917, Matahari faced her execution with the same fearless demeanor that had defined her life. At 41 years old, the woman who once captivated Europe with her sensual dances and secretive allure stood before a French firing squad. Unlike most, she refused to be bound or blindfolded. In a final act of defiance, she blew a kiss to the soldiers tasked with ending her life. Eyewitnesses described the scene with chilling clarity. British reporter Henry Wales, who observed the execution, noted how Matahari remained poised until the very end. As the volley of gunfire echoed, her body slowly crumpled to the ground, her expression unwavering. Even as she sank to her knees, she continued to gaze unflinchingly at those who had condemned her, seemingly unbothered by her fate. It was only after she fell backward that a non-commissioned officer stepped forward and delivered the final fatal shot to her head, ensuring her death. The spectacle of her execution has become a symbol of her enigmatic life, with conflicting reports about what she wore during those final moments. Some say she dressed in an Amazonian-style tailored suit with white gloves, while others claim she wore the same low-cut blouse and tricorn hat chosen by her accusers at her trial. Regardless of the attire, her unyielding spirit left a lasting impression on all who witnessed her final act. Matahari's body, left unclaimed by family, was used for medical research. Her head was embalmed and stored in the Museum of Anatomy in Paris, only to mysteriously disappear decades later. With her remains lost to history, Matahari's legacy remains just as elusive, her life and her defiant death forever shrouded in mystery. Carl Tanzel. The story of Carl Tanzler, or Count Carl von Kossel, as he liked to call himself, is one of the most bizarre and macabre tales in modern history. Born in 1877 in Germany, Tanzler's obsession with death and romantic fantasy would lead him down a dark and twisted path. His infatuation with a young Cuban-American woman named Maria Elena Milagro de Hoyos and what he did after her death would shock the world. Tansler, a radiology technician working at the Marine Hospital in Key West, Florida, met the beautiful Elena in 1930 when she came to the hospital seeking treatment for tuberculosis. Upon meeting her, Tansler became convinced that Elena was the dark-haired woman from his childhood visions, the woman he was destined to love. Desperate to save her, he showered Elena with gifts and attempted various medical treatments. But despite his efforts, Elena succumbed to the disease in 1931. His obsession, however, did not end with her death. Two years after she was buried, Tanzler secretly exhumed Elena's body from its mausoleum. For the next seven years, he lived with her corpse, painstakingly preserving it with wax, silk, and wire. He dressed her in fine clothes, kept her beside him in bed, and used perfume and disinfectants to mask the odor of decomposition. Tanzler claimed that Elena's spirit spoke to him, urging him to take her from the grave. In 1940, Tanzler's morbid secret was discovered when Elena's sister heard rumors and notified authorities. Elena's body, now a grotesque abomination of its former self, was removed from Tanzler's home. Astonishingly, Tanzler was not prosecuted, as the statute of limitations had expired. Public sentiment at the time was strangely sympathetic, with many viewing Tanzler as an eccentric romantic rather than a grave robber. What makes Tanzler's story even more chilling is the suggestion of necrophilia, evidence that he may have engaged in intimate acts with Elena's corpse. Though these claims arose years later, they added a new, horrific dimension to his already grotesque obsession. Tanzler's story remains one of the most disturbing and perplexing cases of love, obsession, and death, blurring the lines between devotion and madness. Kids for Cash Scandal the Kids for Cash scandal remains one of the most shocking and appalling examples of judicial corruption in U.S. history. Beginning in 2008, it came to light that two judges in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, had sentenced thousands of juveniles to unnecessarily harsh penalties in exchange for financial kickbacks. Judges Michael Conahan and Mark Ciavarella orchestrated a scheme to profit from sending young offenders to private detention centers, even for minor infractions. Under the guise of protecting public order, Ciavarella imposed severe sentences on children for offenses as trivial as mocking a school official on social media or trespassing in abandoned buildings. 
The judges received millions of dollars from PA Child Care, a private company operating detention facilities, in exchange for filling their beds with juveniles. The entire system, from sentencing to incarceration, was manipulated for greed with devastating consequences for the lives of thousands of children. Investigations eventually exposed the full extent of the corruption. The FBI and the IRS revealed that the judges had conspired with real estate developers and facility operators, closing down public detention centers and funneling children into private ones. Hundreds of juveniles were tried without legal representation, and many were coerced into pleading guilty without understanding their rights. In 2009, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court took the unprecedented step of overturning the records of more than 2,400 juveniles, recognizing the gross miscarriage of justice. Conahan pleaded guilty to racketeering conspiracy and was sentenced to 17.5 years in federal prison, while Ciavarella was convicted on 12 of 39 counts and sentenced to 28 years. The Killing of Henrik Siviak on a night when the world was reeling from the devastating attacks of September 11, 2001, the city of New York was gripped by chaos and fear. Amidst the confusion and shattered streets, one tragedy slipped into the shadows, forgotten by many yet carrying a haunting mystery that persists to this day. Henrik Siewiak, a Polish immigrant who had come to America in search of a better life, became the victim of a senseless and unsolved murder, the only recorded homicide in New York City on 9-11. Siwiak, a hard-working man who had witnessed the planes crash into the World Trade Center earlier that day, was determined to start a new job that night. Despite his family's warnings, he set off for the Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood of Brooklyn, unaware that he was heading in the wrong direction. Dressed in camouflage clothing, he ventured into unfamiliar and dangerous territory. It was a city on edge, every shadow casting suspicion and fear. At 11.40 p.m., gunshots echoed through the streets. Suiak, wounded in the lung, stumbled toward a nearby house in search of help, but the city was paralyzed by terror. Residents too frightened to answer their doors ignored the sound of the bell. Henrik collapsed on the street, dying just hours after New York's darkest day. What makes Siwiak's death so unsettling is not just its timing, but its mystery. No money was taken, and no clear motive ever emerged. Some speculated that his camouflage jacket and heavy accent may have led someone to mistake him for a terrorist in the heightened atmosphere of fear and paranoia. But there were no witnesses, and the investigation, overshadowed by the events of 9-11, lacked the necessary resources to uncover the truth. Persian Princess In October 2000, a startling discovery in Baluchistan, Pakistan appeared to rewrite history. A mummy, believed to be a Persian princess, surfaced on the black market, stirring intrigue and international disputes. Wrapped in the allure of ancient Egypt and Persia, the supposed princess was found in a gilded coffin adorned with cuneiform inscriptions. She was said to be Rodogun, a daughter of Xerxes, one of Persia, a member of the fabled Achaemenid dynasty. But beneath the ancient wrappings lay a far more disturbing reality. The mummy, dressed as if from a long-lost era, was reportedly put up for sale for a staggering $11 million. As authorities unraveled the mystery, Iranian, Pakistani, and even Afghan officials vied for ownership, each claiming the mummy as a national treasure. However, something about the mummy didn't add up. As experts like Ahmad Hassan Dani and Asma Ibrahim delved deeper, they uncovered strange anomalies. The inscriptions on the mummy's breastplate were riddled with grammatical errors, and carbon dating exposed that the coffin was only about 250 years old, far too young to house an ancient royal. Further investigations revealed the most chilling detail. The body inside was not ancient at all. The woman had died just a few years prior, around 1996. Her body showed signs of violence, hinting at a brutal murder. Her teeth had been forcibly removed, and her pelvic region had sustained severe trauma, possibly from a vehicle impact. The so-called Persian princess was not a royal at all, but a tragic victim her corpse grotesquely staged to deceive and profit. Investigators now faced a far darker case, one not of lost royalty, but of murder, deceit, and greed. Carol Lombard. Carol Lombard, one of the brightest stars of Hollywood's golden age, 
captivated audiences with her wit, charm, and effortless comedic timing. Born as Jane Alice Peters on October 6, 1908, she grew up in a wealthy family and was thrust into the film industry at just 12 years old. What began as a small role in a perfect crime blossomed into an illustrious career, with Lombard becoming the queen of screwball comedies and an American icon. She was ranked 23rd on the American Film Institute's list of greatest female stars, a testament to her enduring legacy. In the late 1920s, Lombard found early success as a Mac Senate bathing beauty, a role she once cited as pivotal in shaping her comedic talent. But it wasn't until 1934's 20th century that she truly solidified her reputation as a leading lady. Directed by her second cousin, Howard Hawks, Lombard's natural, uninhibited performance alongside John Barrymore redefined her persona. Critics praised her newfound fiery talent, and she quickly became one of the most sought-after actresses in Hollywood, starring in classics like My Man Godfrey and To Be or Not To Be. However, Lombard's life was cut tragically short at the age of 33. In January 1942, Lombard, her mother, and press agent Otto Winkler boarded TWA Flight 3 after raising over $2 million for the war effort. Despite her companion's fear of flying, Lombard insisted on taking the plane to return home to Clark Gable. David Selznick and screen stars Olivia de Havilland and Vivian Lee. Her husband since 1939. The flight never made it. On January 16th, the aircraft crashed into Potosi Mountain, killing all passengers aboard, including Lombard and 15 U.S. Army soldiers. The cause of the crash was linked to the flight crew's inability to navigate properly due to the wartime blackout of safety beacons intended to guard against Japanese bombers. Disappearance of Jamie Fraley In the early hours of April 8, 2008, Jamie Fraley, a 22-year-old woman from Gastonia, North Carolina, mysteriously disappeared after telling a friend she was going to the hospital for the third time in 24 hours due to a stomach virus. Fraley, who had struggled with anxiety and bipolar disorder, had been relying on friends and family for transportation as she didn't have a driver's license. That night, she told her friend that someone else was taking her to the hospital, but when asked who, she simply referred to the person as he. She was never seen again. The next day, when Fraley missed an important appointment, her family went to her apartment to check on her, only to find her belongings, wallet, purse, and keys left behind. Her cell phone was missing, but it was later found by utility workers two days after her disappearance. Unfortunately, any potential clues from the phone were compromised by too many people handling it before the police could investigate. Ricky Simon Sr., the father of Fraley's incarcerated fiancé, quickly became a person of interest in her disappearance. Simon Sr. lived in the same apartment complex and had driven Fraley to the hospital earlier that day. He had a criminal history, including serving six years for strangling a former girlfriend to death in the 1980s. Suspicion grew around him, but the investigation into Simon's took a strange turn two months later when he was found dead inside the trunk of a car, apparently from heat stroke. Though his death was ruled accidental, many believed Simon Sr. had taken the truth about Fraley's fate to his grave. Her mother, Kim, tearfully recounted that she always felt he was hiding something. Even Ricky Simons Jr., Fraley's fiancé, was left reeling by the tragic chain of events, saying, Does that make sense to anybody? In 2015, a prison inmate, Jerry Case, claimed he had killed Fraley, but the confession was quickly discredited as he had been incarcerated at the time of her disappearance. Fraley's case remains unsolved, leaving her family still searching for answers to this day. The Rat King The Rat King, a grotesque and rare phenomenon where multiple rats become tangled by their tails, has long haunted the darker corners of human imagination. Picture it, a mass of living rats, their tails intertwined by hair, sap, or even frozen filth, struggling as one grotesque creature. It's more than just a nightmare. Specimens of these tangled monstrosities have been found and preserved in museums around the world. The largest, found in 1828, contained 32 rats forever bound in death. The Rat King isn't just some medieval myth. 
sightings have persisted into modern times. In 2021, a live rat king of 13 rats was discovered in Estonia. Their desperate movements unable to free them from the fate nature had cruelly bestowed. While the phenomenon seems too strange to be true, skeptics have had to reckon with physical evidence, from mummified remains to x-rays of living rats whose tangled tails had healed over time. What causes this macabre occurrence? Some zoologists believe that black rats, creatures notorious for their long, flexible tails, can become accidentally bound together by sticky substances like sap, or even during the cold winter months when they cluster together for warmth. As they panic and thrash, the knot tightens, sealing their fate. Once tangled, the rats face an agonizing struggle for survival, as they pull and tear at one another in a futile attempt to escape. Though the existence of rat kings is debated, with some believing museum specimens to be hoaxes, the chilling reality of living rat kings suggests something more disturbing, a rare but possible nightmare of nature. The image of these creatures bound by fate and filth has found its way into literature and popular culture, appearing in works from Stephen King's It to video games like The Last of Us Part II. In the shadowy world of Wikipedia's darkest corners, the Rat King stands out as a gruesome reminder of nature's most bizarre and horrific possibilities. The Guatemala Syphilis Experiments From 1946 to 1948, the United States conducted a series of unethical human experiments in Guatemala, led by physician John Charles Cutler. These experiments, targeting some of the most vulnerable populations, including soldiers, prisoners, orphans, and sex workers, were designed to study sexually transmitted diseases, STDs, such as syphilis, gonorrhea, and chancroid. Shockingly, over 1,300 individuals were deliberately infected without their informed consent, and only about 700 received any form of treatment. The roots of these experiments lay in a desperate search for effective STD treatments during World War II. The war exacerbated concerns about venereal diseases, which were seen as a threat to military readiness. Early experiments, such as the Terry Haute prison experiments, laid the groundwork for what would become the Guatemala syphilis experiments. Unlike the US-based Terry Haute experiments, however, the Guatemala study moved to a foreign country to avoid the ethical constraints that would have likely prevented such actions on US soil. The methods of infection were as horrifying as the rationale behind them, Prostitutes infected with STDs were paid to have sexual encounters with prisoners, while others were infected by having the bacteria directly applied to open wounds or injected into their bodies. It was not until 2010, more than six decades later, that the U.S. government formally apologized for the atrocities. The revelations, uncovered by Professor Susan Mokotov Reverby, highlighted a deeply unethical chapter in medical history, drawing comparisons to the infamous Tuskegee syphilis experiments in which African-American men were deceived into believing they were receiving treatment for syphilis when, in fact, they were not. Thanks for diving into these eerie rabbit holes with us. If you enjoyed exploring the creepiest pages on Wikipedia, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe for more unsettling mysteries and strange discoveries. Hit the notification bell so you never miss a spine-chilling update. Stay curious and stay spooky.